Good morning, and thank you for uh, attending our session today. My name is Tom Hoover. I'm the Associate Vice Chancellor and Chief Information Officer at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga, and this is uh, Jerry Flynn, the Senior Director of IT Administration and Client Services for Pepperdine University. Uh, Pepperdine University, um, kind of a tale of two cities here. Uh, UTC, uh, so again, tale of two cities as far as public versus private. Uh, UTC has about 11,500 students located on the East Coast, obviously. And uh, we have, again, about uh, 11,500 students, about uh, 1,200 staff faculty, and we are a Master's One institution. Uh, Pepperdine University, a, um, a liberal arts university, a medium to small size private Christian school uh, located in, as you can see on the right-hand side, at uh, Paradise or Malibu, Malibu California, um, sits on the ocean. Um, about 7,600 students, undergrad and grad, uh, five different graduate schools, uh, and Seaver, the undergrad college. Um, so just a, a beautiful place. I used to work at Pepperdine. And um, as far as uh, we have student fees at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga, or a tech fee, um, and they do not. Also, um, kind of a little bit different as far as the roles that we play, as far as we have an engineering school, they have a liberal arts school, um, there is a graduate school for business and management, education psychology, school public policy, school of law, in addition to uh, their CBER, which is their undergrad college. We have a graduate school um, that has uh, education and primarily OT, occupational therapy, physical therapy, and um, engineering, computer college of business, and, and whatnot. So similar uh, situations, similar schools, but yet similar, prop, but also different and uh, different problems as well. I'll go into and talk a little bit about UTC and some of the problems that, that we have. As far as our environment, we have about, uh, 12, about 1,700 staff faculty machines, uh, about 900 lab machines, and that's those primarily within, uh, that's controlled under Central IT. Uh, there are machines that are in our engineering school uh, that are not controlled by Central IT, they're controlled by uh, the specific college. Uh, there's about, we have about 300 VDI uh, machines so our virtual desktops, and those are spread across our, our general labs, and um, mostly most of our colleges have those. It's just you know, general use of, using computers. About 23 Mac, you know, give or take a little bit, depending on how good the latest Mac commercial is. And about 76 PCs of the uh, 1700, they're in about, uh, about 54 different labs. So, um, again, like I'm sure most of you all have here, uh, limited resources, uh, staff, and money. Uh, when I came there, oh, and right now we have under our, our you would say our, uh, our field support group has about three people in it. We've had to pull off people to work in other areas, but limited, and also as far as resources, uh, limited money to go out there and invest in things. And that's uh, that's essentially why we came up with a solution that we came up that that we are using at UTC. Just a little a little imaging background. Um, we has anyone ever heard of ZenWorks? Okay, so. Uh, use Zen, we have used ZenWorks in the past. We've also used some open source. I see my friend from San Diego here. Um, using uh, Ghost as well. And in fact, we weren't even consistent in, in IT. We had one of our labs, one of our, our labs in our university center was using one imaging solution. And then the other labs in the other IT departments or in the other areas that we managed were actually using a different solution. So we, we weren't even consistent in our own area. Um, as far as one of the real onuses why we, we chose to go with um, SCCM is really that one of our, our guys latched onto it. Um, we had actually put aside, I'd put aside about $200,000 to go for case and couldn't do it. We had a, a budget cut. So one of my uh, staff members just said, okay, fine. We don't have that money. We actually ended up going to having, uh, going to get some network storage. So. We went ahead and uh, chose SCCM, which is or SCCM, which is part of your Microsoft. If you have a Microsoft contract, so essentially we traded instead of buying an appliance, we went ahead and bought, um, used one of our people to go ahead and install S SCCM. We've also added uh, Shavlik as a patch manager for, for third party. Um, you can't do patch management on SCCM straight or SCC. I've always said I always. Add an extra S in there, so I will try and do my best to correct that. Um, but so we're using a patch management tool, uh, Shavlik, and then uh, Casper, 
that goes ahead and man we can control our Max on this side, so we can do imaging with Max, um, and then also do software deployment with Max. Max, we are managing about 54 applications um, through this currently right now, so we're able to do software updates, we'll do patching, um, we're able to you know take care of a fair amount of things with it. Again, you know when you talk about three people trying to manage 1,700 machines. Um, you know, I could say it would be part of our wellness program to try and get them exercise, but sneaker net really doesn't work, um, and you can't get out there fast enough, and it's just not, just not fair to them. So, as far as uh, you know, the implementation, really the big thing was getting buy-in. Um, as you all know, when you change anything, any threat to change is you know pretty much you're trying to end the world, you're trying to take away everything they have. So we really engaged the faculty. Um, and we've sat down with uh, the department chairs to really sit down with them. It's been a really good opportunity to sit down with them and actually take a step back, because essentially you're starting a lab from scratch. So taking a step back and saying, okay, really, what software programs do you need? In the past, you know, they probably had software on there for five, ten years. It was probably since uh, you know, Windows 3.2 on there. But we can actually get an opportunity to actually put the correct software that's on there and actually have discussions about them. Okay. That's the software. Do you have the latest version? Can you handle the latest version? Does this version actually work on Windows 7, or are we still talking, you know, working in a very, very old OS? So that's been a good, that's been a very good um, discussion. And also, at the same time, it's kind of iron sharpens iron. It allows them an opportunity. We give them an opportunity to actually look and see if they actually have the correct version, uh, if they have a version that it was is where they should be, uh, so their students can get that. We've kind of set up a little uh, uh, service level agreement style with them where we have expectations, we talk about what we will do, we talk about what they would do. Uh, what we do obviously is manage the computer. What they will do is uh, give us the accurate software um, and making sure, of course, that they have the correct licenses, which is a, another thing that's a, that, that pops up. We also sit down, we talk about agreed patching windows. Okay, we will patch and primarily we do this over breaks uh, or at night when students aren't there um, and make sure that they're on the, we're on the same version that they're going to be teaching for their classes. So that's, that's a great thing. Uh, again, talking about um, install, uh, software installed vision, uh, versions, and, um, and then again, about 54 apps. But uh, it's, it, it's, it's been a very good opportunity to kind of, again, start from scratch about this. And um, it's, uh, as far as you've seen now what we did at UTC, we'll go ahead and pass it over to Jerry here, and he'll talk about what they did at Pepperdine. Thank you, Tom, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so you saw Chattanooga's challenges and, and the solution that they chose, as well as how they implemented it. I'd like to um, tell you about Pepperdine's experience, and, and first off, uh, starting with our challenges, why did we pursue device management? And so uh, we did so for a number of reasons, but among the, the two most compelling reasons were um, uh, viruses and malware and uh, the inability to inventory effectively hardware and software. And let me give you a little background of, of how we provide support at Pepperdine. So as Tom indicated, uh, Pepperdine University uh, is comprised of five schools. We have the, the main campuses in, in Malibu. We have five campuses in the Los Angeles area, a small one in Northern California, uh, one in D.C., Washington, and then a handful uh, globally, internationally. And uh, there's a, a central IT department, which I represent, as well as a decentralized one. Um, we have embedded liaisons in some of the academic divisions, the undergraduate school. Um, so with that, you can see it's somewhat of a fractured support model, both uh, central, decentral, embedded, uh, local, and, and everybody has a great deal of autonomy. The problems with that support model is it results in a disparity of um, how labs and other and, and university owned assets are, are are managed so for example some people uh, may be responsible for a school or a campus or a lab and um, use deep freeze very effectively and keep everything up to date others less so perhaps and um, uh, in addition there was uh, at least one orphaned lab that uh, very generous uh, donation from the, the president's office tricked out a beautiful a modern uh, high traffic lab, and then no one thought who was going to support that ultimately. So it, it obviously came to central IT. Um, so you see sort of the, the fractured support model, and, and, and what do we do? Now, meanwhile, um, 
people have full admin access to their machines. And I'm thinking of, um, you know, in the academic environment, uh, we try to do that to encourage research and, and freedom, give people that freedom. At the same time, um, not everybody uses that admin access uh, as, as well or enlightened as they should. So I'm thinking of, of one person I like very, very much, and she has an affinity for cats, for kittens. And apparently there's a download that you can get, and there's kittens jumping around your desktop, and that's wonderful. But apparently those cats are kind of malicious and... Uh, and, and infected her computer. And so we started getting increased uh, viruses and malware uh, in certain pockets because of this elevated admin access and perhaps the technical support in that area not helping them combat it as well. Uh, now, some would update their programs, you know, but, but many wouldn't. And so um, with that proliferation, we tried to find a way, instead of reacting after the fact, how can we try to make it so people can't get in trouble or at least minimize that risk. The, um, on the inventory side, <clears throat> because as I intimated, there's different people responsible for different machines, there are times when we'd really want to know um, who's got what, you know, what hardware is out there, what are we supporting, are, are we getting full value, uh, what kind of operating systems, where are they at, who do we have to communicate to when we deprecate an operating system. Um, on the inventory side, the different schools, who have licensed software, perhaps SBSS, and as an institution, we're getting full bang for our buck. As economic times, you know, got tighter, it was uh, profligate for this school to buy 100 licenses and that one. Really, collectively, we could do a far better job. So we sought a device management product to kind of address these things first, to kind of prevent bad stuff from happening and to get more reporting of where are machines, who's got what, Etc. And so the solution that we chose was the uh, Dell case product. And um, uh, we utilized uh, group policy to, um, to put it on the PCs. Um, and we learned, remember I said, hey, who's got what and how many machines? We have 2,468, about 2,500 university-owned computers, 80% of which are Windows. Um, by the way, part of the solution, IT Ninja, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but uh, is a community of, uh, of IT folks who are ninja-like. They're very, very bright, very smart. And so part of our solution was learning it very heavily ourselves and finding uh, any number of ways that we, we, we could do that. And so engaging the IT Ninja community and then contributing to it. Now, we piloted CASE in 2012. Uh, and really wanted to know it well and master it well before we went live because we'd be touching every computer uh, on campus. We went live in 2013 and um, we really committed to this when we saw the power of it and also if we didn't harness that power well, how, um, if we didn't really know it well, we could inadvertently do some things uh, or develop a bad reputation. So we really committed resources to it, both uh, human resources, freeing up people or assigning people to, to learn this. Um, the funding, um, we were very lucky uh, to, to have the funding to be able to go get the appliances and pay the money to do it. And then the training. We had the, the case folks come on site. We went to them. We put money away to, uh, every year to go to the annual Dell conference in, in Austin, Texas, uh, rent a house and have a, the whole team go down there and really pick the brains of the Dell and uh, folks and the roadmap has come down the pike, the IT Ninja community, et cetera. And so the goal, as I said, was to really master the product and fully utilize it, not just, you know, one of the modules and so forth. And of course, to have a successful implementation. So I'd like to detail that implementation. Uh, we purchased two solutions from Dell, what's known as the, the K1000 and K2000. The, K1 box, K2 box, as they're called. In the K1 box, we focused uh, on its patching capabilities to prevent those mal the malware, viruses, that type of thing. And the K2000, we obtained it to be able to um, do what are called managed installs or imaging to, to push uh, programs to university-owned machines. As you can see, there are many other modules and as I just indicated, we're really committed to using this to its full capability, so we planned in phases to try to touch and utilize as many of the, um, the features as they come with. 
Um, so as I indicated, for the PCs, we use group policy to uh, put the agent on every computer so that it could do its work. The Macs were more challenging. Um, we use network access control, Bradford system, if you're familiar, to identify them, but we, we, don't, we don't have the full agent on uh, the machines that would allow us to push uh, case. So we then had, we could identify who has universally owned Macs, but then we, um, we contacted them uh, and encouraged them to download the agent, and then uh, a fair number did that. Um, those who didn't, we had to use sneaker net and go around and, and, uh, and put, it, put it on. So as I indicated, 80% uh, of our about 2,500 machines were PCs, the other 20% were Macs. Um, and so we started in 2012 learning about it, 2013 implemented. In the last two years, we've been rolling out some of the features with a phase plan going down the pike. I'll tell you more about that later, but here's Tom to tell you about his successes and his implementation, some of the challenges. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, as far as uh, what we found from our successes were uh, better lab management. Um, we were actually able to imagine that and maintain a lab and actually keep it up to date um, and do a much better job of, uh, you know, not having broken computers in the middle of class. Um, the nice thing is that we could literally image a, a machine or a lab if needed in minutes. So if we had one professor who was teaching one thing, we could actually change it over an hour later if they're teaching an entirely different subject, if we had a different image, we could go ahead and image it differently. We're also able to um, remotely, we can actually, well, if they, if they call the help desk and, and need, or our call center need help, we can actually, while they're on the phone, we can actually kick out and install something while we're talking to the professor on the phone. Um, or if they need something else, a patch, or we'll go ahead and uh, we can actually just deploy it without them actually even knowing it. Uh, and it just literally just shows up there, the software will show up there installed and ready to go. Uh, they have actually done that while I was speaking during one meeting. Uh, there wasn't a particular pr application or a, a program installed on the machine that I was using in the university center. And um, while I was sitting there talking and asking, saying, hey, why wasn't this installed? They actually had installed it in the background. So um, it's much better as far as uh, remote support. Um, as far as you can actually, like Jerry was talking about, you can application so you can actually know what applications are installed for licenses and for compliance reasons. It's awesome. Uh, you can go ahead and actually see, you can tell someone exactly how many applications you have installed of this on the campus. Um, we recently had an uh, audit from Adobe. Um, we didn't have this installed at the time, so um, we went ahead and we are under compliance because we signed a three-year agreement with the rest of the state of Tennessee or with the University of Tennessee system with Adobe, but we did that because we, didn't, we couldn't tell you exactly how many versions of Adobe we had installed. Not Acrobat, but um, Creative Suite and all those things, how many we had installed. So, you know, that was about $600,000 a year. So it's a, it's a big cost. But this, if we had had this installed, that would have been much, much easier. And we would have been able to, to, to tell them exactly what we had installed. Uh, as far as um, some of the challenges change, and I'm sure you all face the same thing when you want to change anything, um, especially if you're a faculty. And I'll be honest, if I was a faculty member, I'd, I would be scared too. They are getting paid. This is their thing. They want the lab set up the way they want it. They want the software, and if the same software has been on there forever, they want that software on there because they just want to show up and teach. They want it to work, and if, you don't, if they have it set up the right way or it's been set up that way and they know what it's set up, they don't want it to change. I understand that. Um, but we try and sell it that it's a better situation. We're actually improving the process. So change is always hard, um, especially I think, I think we had to have an entire seminar on change and how to manage that at, at, a, uh, at, a, at a university. We also have non-central IT departments that are out there. I just got an email yesterday um, about this. We have non-IT groups out there, non-central IT groups out there that want to use it, yet they don't want to get the training, but yet they want full control over everything. Well, you all know full control of everything really means full control over anything, everything. They literally could then go ahead and change anything on any computer on campus. Um, that's not something I want to give up easily because, I mean, if I'm held accountable, I want to be held accountable for the people that I know have been trained and know how to use it. I don't want to be able to give someone else that doesn't, that I know has the correct training to be able to do it. So that is a huge, a huge issue. And 
you know, it's a, a, case, a, case, a case of us also trying to learn the product enough that we can, can, can tell people how to use it versus they want it from the day one when we're not ready and we're not comfortable with letting other groups use it. Um, then it comes down to uh, security. As I mentioned before, this is a huge security vulnerability here. Um, not only from, from the challenges to make sure we have it all patched, but you, know, you literally having are getting the keys to the kingdom here, um, which is, and then as far as challenge and budgets, um, you know, you have to be, we ended up using some money. We have some extra hours from Microsoft that we buy, we kind of buy a lump sum that we get an extra number of hours uh, per year from Microsoft. So that's how we've done this. We've done consulting where we use our hours, our Microsoft hours to go and do this. We have also sent them to, I think it's TechEd, the, the conference from Microsoft recently had in Chicago. Uh, so we have sent our guys there to kind of get trained and kind of learn more about it um, and reach out to other universities that are doing it. But, you know, um, it's, it's taken us, we are started, we were about a year and a, about a year and a half into it. Um, and we are now, what we're now doing is, you know, we're deploying it more and more as every, com every person buys a new computer, we're putting it on there. Um, but it's taken time. I mean, I, it would have been nice to have it up last year, but it's literally just a kind of a phase and kind of a step, and every day we're, we're, we're better off by installing on more computers. Um, and then also, I mean, just the, just the fear of Big Brother. Um, that's a huge, huge, huge fear. Um, and a lot of faculty members have that, you know, you're going to get in, you're going to see, especially on research purposes or if they're working on a book, they're, they're concerned. And, and I understand that, but it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a challenge. Mm -hmm. Now I'll go ahead and pass it over to, to Jerry, and Jerry will talk about the challenges and successes that he had at Pepperdine. Thank you, Tom. And, um, you know, so Tom indicated that they're kind of rolling this out as new machines come online. And we, um, we in, at Pepperdine, in, uh, as I indicated, had the team together and kind of mastered it and then did it in one big bang. Um, and so our first goal was to combat those viruses and malware and that kind of thing. And uh, we partnered very closely with the uh, uh, chief information security office, officer and his, his group. And he revealed to us that even people who keep their stuff updated uh, decently uh, and don't do malicious things, don't download you know, coupon printers or, or the dancing cats, can still get themselves in trouble. They can go to a legitimate website that the LA Times, New York Times, Boston Globe, uh, that has an advertisement and it, it'll serve up a good ad, it'll serve up a good ad, and then it'll serve up a malicious one that will find a weakness in one of these popular programs, uh, Java, Flash, or Reader, and, and, um, and infect it. Um, and so th these were our first, uh, this, this was our first order of business, was to patch Java, Flash, and, and Reader, and we used that, the K1000 to do that and had a lot of success. You know, we had a, a real low compliance rate historically. Used the device management tool to update these and really kind of in this process mastered and developed a, a methodology because there is some concern uh, and because you do have the keys of the kingdom, we came up with a very tight, strict, rigorous um, procedure for testing it ourselves. We call it the, uh, the dog food team. Uh, to then expand it a little bit to a larger group, um, and then finally to, to release it globally. And in developing that system, now anything subsequently that we roll out, we're very rigorous in making sure that before we go live, we know what we're doing. So we had a fair bit of success with that. <clears throat> and so flush with that success, we used the K2000. Remember, that's, that gives you the ability to image or to, to push uh, programs. Um, and we use that for, um, updating Windows XP was deprecated um, and most people had done that but many some hadn't and so we used it to um, to load Windows 7 and then we have a, a enterprise license for Adobe Acrobat Pro and we um, we use the K2000 to uh, give that to everybody and at the same time to remove all other versions of, of uh, earlier versions of Acrobat or, or Reader um, and in this process, really learn how to use the, the K2000 well and what are called managed installs. There's a concept of imaging. There's another concept of just installing uh, programs and scripts. And we had um, really learned from that process. <clears throat> just a, a, a recent success that uh, uh, kind of is the culmination of 
in, how quickly we can act if we need to is, you may know that about two weeks ago, Mozilla blacklisted uh, Flash for a security reason. It affected a great number of people. Adobe issue, subsequently issued a security update, and we were able to use our, our system now to update our, our university-owned assets. And within a week, we had 94% of the Macs and 96% of the PCs with the, the latest version of Flash. And at this time of the year, I, I anticipate the other 5% or so are probably on vacation, haven't turned on their computers. So this was a great success, and we feel comfortable that when we need to, need to move fast, we can. What I'd like to do is just share uh, some of the keys to success that I think, after having this under our belt for a couple of years, is having a top quality core team, the folks working on it um, I, I are really committed to it, and institutionally we committed to them. Um, getting them deep training and really known, knowing the product, the capabilities, both what you can do and what you should look out for. This thorough testing prior uh, to, to releasing anything. A pervasive communication plan, because to combat some of the things that Tom was talking about, where there's a, a concern about Big Brother, or what can be done, what can you see, this kind of thing, we have developed a, um, a blog that any time we do anything, we list what we've patched, so those who are tech, technically oriented can go look what was patched. Many, most people in the community aren't, so the front side of the blog is just, just friendly, layman English about, hey, and you saw that last entry, updated flash in a flash, tell people what's going on. Um, having high touch, soft rollouts, I, I think was very successful. And, and what I mean by that is, you're able to um, implement uh, location-based IP range. Uh, there are things called labels and what are called smart labels. It knows because of your IP what campus you're on or what building you're in. And so we would roll it out in phases. To, uh, initially, when we brought the installed the agent uh, to a group of people, and we had real high touch. We'd walk the halls and shake hands and tell them what we're doing, and um, and got them familiar with the icon and what might pop up subsequently how to interact with it if that did happen. Uh, and so it wasn't this big brother thing is watching me was, hey, I know, I know Jerry, and he said this is good and it's got the Pepperdine P, and that's okay to, to install those updates, and otherwise don't do anything else, you know, we'll take care of it. And I think that's really effective because we've had zero, I think, no, that's not accurate. We've had very, very few con uh, complaints. Uh, and the other ones were, were misguided, and so we went back and said, hey, you know, that's, that's actually not us, it's WSUS that's updating that. And, um, finally, managing the scope. There's so much that can be done, and I think, we, you know, we focus very heavily on getting a few things right and learn from those and learn from the mistakes. Uh, and then from that knowledge, uh, we're able to plan a, a larger phase scope to, to bring in the other modules. Now, not everything was, um, was as successful, of course. Um, and so I'd like to share our challenges. Um, Tom mentioned these, and so I've, I've duplicated them. You know, it's, uh, the, the money is always a concern. You've got to get the security right. Those other departments uh, you got to get them on board and uh, of course just change 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 but specifically at, at Pepperdine I, I want to share with you a couple of our challenges because you don't want to do this first one and that was we had what I like to call euphemistically an accidental go live uh, you know I said we were so rigorous in this planning and training and that was true except for one very very important thing was at the very first time <clears throat> one of our techs thought he was doing the dog food thing and only touching our machines but actually it he, he pushed it to everybody. And uh, remember I said we didn't have many complaints? We actually had a few that time. Like, what is, what, what is this thing popping up? And so we were able to combat it quickly and decommission so it didn't affect too many people. But you really got to know what you're doing. You do not want to do the accidental go live. You, um, it can affect a lot of people very, very quickly. Uh, and so don't do that. The other thing is, if you're installing this for the first time, there are some, what I like to call, grossly out-of-date computers. Uh, they need a thousand updates, and, um, which will require you know, rebooting several times, typically. 
and that can be invasive and for the end user perspective it's like well oh, I don't like this system that's their first exposure to it I got to reboot and this Pepperdine P is popping up all the time so you can identify that remember I said like the inventory you can kind of identify who's got a very old OS or who has a very old version of this that and the other thing and what I might suggest uh, is reaching out to those people ahead of time before going live and going, hey, this new thing's coming down the pike, but uh, either you should update your computer, do you mind if I help you do that, if you can afford the resources to, to do that? Um, because then there's far less, uh, in, in, you know, in interference. Um, and just two other challenges, I think, that were unique to Pepperdine is getting your own text to buy into this new model. They might be very comfortable in using different tools to to update things, Altiris, et cetera. Um, they, uh, they might also feel a certain responsibility, this is my area, this is my lab, and saying, hey, look, we can do it far more efficiently remotely. Let's free up your time, energy effort, take some things off your plate, you can do something else. But getting that, uh, you know, the core team is key, but also getting both your central, decentral, whoever, colleagues you interact with is saying, hey, this is a really good, efficient way to do things. Come and learn about it. We can give you access to parts of the different modules or the reporting features, uh, the, the inventory for software. Um, bring people on board and get them to buy in. And then finally, um, committing to those phase goals. It's easy to have a little success and then you, you get busy with your, your daily life and you never get around to uh, all those other things that can be done, uh, like uh, power management. You can turn machines off and save electricity. Uh, many, the reporting feature is very, very powerful. Um, but if we're going to spend the money to get the, the resources, we're really committing to um, training people and, and touching as many of those modules as we can. So what you've heard today is the, the tale of two cities, University of Tennessee at Chattanooga and the innovative ways they've used resources to, to uh, Im implement device management. You heard about Pepperdine uh, and how we've done it. We have about five minutes left. Tom and I would like to open up the floor and, and uh, handle any questions. So, so you're saying writing policy about what, how it can be used and what we will support? Oh, that, yeah, that, that's excellent. I, I, don't, I don't know about your school, Tom, but um, we, we haven't, haven't done that. But from this experience, we're seeing a mechanism that that's, that's where we want to go and just have a single web page of this is what's being deprecated, this is what's being, uh, coming online. Because we don't have that problem as much as we have people who, who uh, like kind of bleeding edge, they want the latest before we feel comfortable to support it. So what we'd like to do is there's a module, a self-service library where they can get programs, and we'd like to have a single web page that says, look, and, you know, so conversely, there are those who want the latest and greatest, and there are those who are like, please don't ever take XP away from me to the last day. Or, or my typewriter, yeah. So what we want to do is have this web page that says, look, I don't care where you are. If you're here, go get it. Understand there's, there's no support. Let us know how things go, because that'll be useful. If, if you want to hold on to the last, great. But once that day hits, this goes by, and you get Windows 7, or whatever that version will be. Um, and so, we, long story short, we don't have that policy, but it's where we want to go and just go, look, this is it. You have a lot of freedom. Hold on to it as long as you want. Get it new. We won't support you. This will disappear. And then just say, ladies and gentlemen, that is what happens at university-owned machines. It's where we want to go. We have, when we sit down with a faculty member of the department chair, we, have, we do have those t discussions. Um, I'm not sure if we necessarily put that on paper. Um, we, we try to have those discussions. Uh, what we actually do is we'll set up like we have, a, so there's certain versions that will work on our banner product. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we kind of put, set up GPOs where we have different people put in different classes so we have different versions of Adobe. Um, so that's kind of how, and that's another way that you could solve some of those things. But yes, no, and we're trying to do some type of a centralization where we try, we buy most of the software through student, student tech fee. Um, but yes, when they go out and buy their own stuff, we, we don't know. Um, it's, it's stats program. Yeah. We have two that we support. We do SAS and SPSS. Mm -hmm. We have and both I want two. For this, or I came from this university, and I want to use this. Mm -hmm. You're the only guy using it. Yeah. yeah. No, no, we can't put it on the molded image for the VDI because. <laughs> 
Well, the, no, there is. Yeah. Yeah. There, I mean, there is something you might want to look at. There's something called Key Server. Um, okay, because that's how we did. But yes, we have three or four different ones. Uh, we have three or four different statistical analysis programs. I know it's it's a it's a pain. I know. One thing I would suggest when you write your policy, um, don't put the software in the policy. Put the right. standards. Keep it to the standards. Yeah. You can change it quickly. The policy yeah. you know, signed off by the administration. It's a great point. Excellent point. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. You mentioned banner and this is actually covered by I'm not sure what the use banner. But people saw. People saw. Mm -hmm. Okay, so one issue with banner uh, that we run into is the Java updates. We're going to update their Java and the frames. Yes. That or the other things. So, how would you recommend? I, you said you did the automated Java. We, we, can, we control it. Okay. So, people that are heavily banner, we only let the version that we know will work. So then they just... We handle their... We, ha we handle, yeah. And that seems to have helped. And then regarding the K2, are you on a multi-pass using your K2? Uh, no, we're not. Uh, but um, there's, a, there's a lot of capability to doing that. Well, that, that's a good question. The, um, it kind of depends a little bit on the, on the bandwidth uh, of the area, and so, some are better than others. Uh, um, but we have also have, for our, our remote sites, uh, a server on site that will take the image and do it a lot quicker. Um, um, maybe a, a, an hour or so. We, um, it, again, depending on the location of the site, we haven't really tested for speed or gotten uh, too much in a, in a that component yet, as opposed to installs for single programs or you know an individual uh, who needs support wiping the machine. Um, it, that's kind of our next phase is really mastering that and from cradle to grave, being able to image as quickly as possible. But I've seen other institutions do it do it like that at the Dell Case Conference. And with that, it's 10 a.m., ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for coming today. Have a great. Uh, rest of the conference.